So we will continue then. And we will continue with the second panel, which is called Structural Adjustment. And um, basically, it means going on working on the questions that uh, deals with the consequences of the parallel development of a counterculturalization of uh, resistance opposition policies on the one hand and uh, cybernetization of politics on the other hand. All this in the overall context of the whole Earth Blue Planet complex. What I'm going to do now is introduce the panelists to you. On the far right from us, from your point of view, on the far left, Tom Hornet. He's an art historian, publisher, cultural scientist and researcher. And he has been doing a lot about um, didactics, teaching, education, where he's looked at both alternative and mainstream institutions focusing particularly on artistic uh, educational practices as well as utopias. We also will hear from Katja Diefenbach, who's on my left. She is a member of um, the sort of B-Books uh, publishing and uh, book trading collective that many of you in Berlin will know. Uh, I think she's teaching in Hamburg, yes. Um, and uh, at the Academy of Arts there. And on the far left, we have Mercedes uh, Bunz. She's at the, what's it called in Lunenburg? The Leuphana, that's the name, Leuphana University. And what's the other name again? What is it you're doing? Oh, yes, The Quiet Revolution is what she's uh, working about. Uh, that's a, a book she's written about the digital world. So we will hear from the three in that sequence. And we're going to have 15 minutes per um, speaker, and then we'll have a discussion. So, Tom, please, you will start. Um, let's have the slides for my presentation. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to be here, and thank you also for giving me an opportunity to um, be part of a longer the project uh, really looks at the interfaces and links between artistic production, knowledge production, and teaching, focusing on the 1960s and 1970s, very much against the backdrop of the, of the Cold War. So we're trying to do a bit of deep drilling in these matters, although the, the element of art and aesthetics is perhaps less dominant here. What I'm going to do is stay pretty close to the material of the exhibition and, and uh, also to the whole Earth catalog in my attempt to uh, go into the, the sort of concepts of education and teaching, which I'll try to focus on. In the mid-1970s, the philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard pointed out the drastic uh, loss of the image, the reputation of work among French young people. They're saying, as he, he wrote, uh, work is not seen as imbue being imbued with moral value, like it's good to work, nor an individual ideal I can self-realize through work. Work, uh, Lyotard says, had lost its motivational power, both with a view to the functioning of individuals in capitalist production conditions, but also in the sense of a socialist critique of industrial labor conditions. Capitalism, of course, doesn't care whether work is assigned any value, because for capitalism, all that is important is that work exists. But the changes in the disposition of the uh, way in which uh, work products, tools, and type of work were considered, which are really part of the loss of value of labor. That was what mattered to him, because on the back of a traditional definition of work of labor, uh, what Lyotard called the distribution of effects on activities changed in a profound way as well. 
Instead of talking about a redistribution of effects on the point of view of activities, we could also t- speak of a dissolution of the borders between the system of wage work, paid work, and the outer, the work of socialist reproduction, the way it has happened in the wake of post-Fordist structural adjustment. Immaterial and effective work as dominant, though not exclusive, modi of work in the current accumulation regime of flexibilized and globalized production are often transversal in a contradictory way. They transverse the separated spheres of work for gain and unpaid work, work and play, office and home, public and private, institution and individual, thereby almost letting disappear the binarities of space and gender. But this is only apparently so. These are structural adjustments which have a temporarily liberating but by and large subordinating impact. And we're dealing with the impact of that today. It wouldn't have been so successful in implementation if what Lyotard talked about, the redistribution of effect on activities, hadn't been culturally and aesthetically uh, accompanied. In the following, I'd like to focus on some factors uh, which we need for the dubious success of this debinarization, namely the phenomenon of a critical revision of education and teaching ideas in the context of alternative educational concepts of the US American counterculture of the late 1960s and 1970s. Looking at the extraordinary career, the whole Earth catalog with its flanking and uh, subordinate projects, such as the ones of Stuart Brand, um, there are lots of answers one can give for that. Ansem and Diedrich are working on, on a variety of these answers from clever branding using the Apollo um, photographs of blue marble by multiply embedding the West Coast countercultures um, into this, also looking at uh, a future viable link of ecological and cybernetical discourse. But there is one dimension which remains implicit only. Uh, which is communicated through a conception and display of the exhibition rather than having a special subject devoted to it. What I mean is the dimension of specific teaching, the alternative education project, which was also part of the whole of catalogue on which it was actually based. And if I see this correctly, the dialectic setup of the exhibition is reflected in it. It uh, is about the digressive and apparently nonlinear way of uh, persuading a complex argument in, in framing and presenting material. This is an educational product which is part of its own paradox because the idea of liberation, of dropping out of the administered technocratic world could also be liberating from being liberating from the necessity of education, should actually be that. But instead of that, we have a pedagogy about the liberation of a subject diversion or schooling, liberating from changed awareness, holistic experience of the self, the other, the collective, discovering emotions and effects of material of personality is something that needs to be learned and taught with the help of a complex setup of pedagogical tools. Stuart Brand never allowed anybody to doubt of the doubt the importance of education for his uh, enterprise. Just looking at the legendary in function and purpose, uh, the, the motto which is divided into function and uh, purpose, which is printed on the um, a sleeve, the inward sleeve of the whole Earth catalog that already showed that education was of central importance. The catalog was supposed to be seen as a list of useful, uh, cheap, but also unusual tools which you could order by mail, which came accompanied with values and recommendations, but which are all goods which were not already common knowledge. Goods that could be used as tools, but above all, and this is what I'm interested in, which considered to be relevant to independent education, quote unquote. Uh, the selection of mail order uh, obtainable, ready to hand things, pre latour tools which are part of a holistic way of the world, were hybrid from typical commercial uh, mail order catalogues like the Sears catalog, well known, and memographic do-it-yourself underground publications. So the commercial sense and subversive educational idea came together to um, realize a defined purpose that was the 
leaving the capitalist technocratic form of society behind. Politics, economy, and education had alienated human beings from being like God, although it's not quite clear which God or type of divinity was meant here by Brand. But what was it what it was all about now was to become clear to the responsibility of being human being and being divine. The whole of catalog company gave itself with a lot of bathos the, the job of having a promoting a dissident capitalism critical type of movement on, on its way to planetary understanding. The project of the social cultural movement was a post-political policy of subjectivity, a new type of work, an area of intimate personal power, a realm of intimate personal power of every single individual. This power, which wanted to achieve autonomy and self-determination, was something that Brand considered to be the power of the individual, to describe its own uh, the power they needed to conduct its own education, to find uh, his own uh, inspiration, shape his own environment, and share his adventure with whoever is interested. That was very much uh, in agreement with other reformist theories of uh, a critique of education, such as in the books of uh, Buckminster Fuller's Education Automation, written in 1962, or looking at Paul Book Goodman's book Compulsory Miseducation, published 1963, or Ivan Ilyich's Deschooling Society of 1970, all of which were offered in the whole Earth, whole Earth catalogue. Many of these authors um, also were part and parcel of the free school movement in the United States, which um, it, since 1967 uh, was a, a paradigm for the apparent, at least, revolution of education for some years. I looked at some of the impulses of this reform movement in the first of the century. They looked at the debate about the current educational system, the, the sort of schooling of society as the civil rights movement, the counterculture, but above all, members of the white uh, middle classes led the debate. And on that basis, they developed concepts of radical, alternative, anti-authoritarian, and self-determined type of teaching. Under learning, that was basically to have textbooks and materials for, which would make kids and young people independent of public schools. The whole Earth Catalog had a lot of pages reserved for literature and contact addresses for the free school movement. By looking at the learning section of the whole of the catalog between 1970 and 1972, it was extended and the Big Rock Candy Mountain was published, for example. That was a catalog which followed the Stuart Brandt model and was therefore seen as a resource for textbook information considered to be useful for alternative education. As the in the whole earth catalogue, the material in Big Rock Candy Mountain was described and assessed very extensively categories such as process learning, educational environments, classroom materials, home learning, self-discovery, and education and consciousness were supposed to contribute to uh, finding one's way around this uh, emerging field of uh, teacher theory and practical work. Education was here considered and defined in a very broad-based sense for different age groups and uh, following different uh, teaching approaches. Apart from traditional um, materials such as reading or arithmetic, in the Big Rock Candy Mountain, they looked at subjects like health food, sexuality, death, uh, religions of the world, or even physical fitness. Emphasizing subjects of education and, and bringing up kids in the extended context of the whole of catalog is something which can be traced back to the mission of the Portola Institute in Menlo Park, a small place of the bay, in the Bay Area. Richard Raymond set up this educational foundation, which was non-profit, uh, set up in 1966, and one year later, after its foundation, Stuart Brand joined it. And the foundation helped develop other organizations, developed uh, mandates for innovative and unusual educational projects, many of which were less than successful at the beginning. 1967, a, a brand planned, uh, apparently pretty expensive, uh, uh, countercultural education fair had to be cancelled, as did the EIEIO, Electronic Interconnect Educated Intellect Operation, that also needed to be cancelled. And Brand was still working on it when, in 1968, he uh, presented the Whole Earth Catalogue idea to Raymond. The beginning of the Whole Earth project was actually from a Modar lending library, the Whole Earth truck store. Uh, which was housed in the 1963 Dodge lorry, and Brand and his wife Lois drove through the United States with it. And then the truck became a store in Menlo Park, and that was the original organization basis of the Hill Earth Catalog. For Brand, very early on, it was very important to make available uh, the analog in those days, uh, data, the books, the magazines, plus uh, instructions for how to do it yourself, how to obtain knowledge and, and uh, like the encyclopedists of the 18th century, 
And he did see himself as a successor. The brand was a knowledge entrepreneur who, see, who saw uh, providing uh, information about the resources of doing good was his business. In the first um, edition, the catalog has one division of the Portola Institute, that's what it was called. And apart from computer education for grade levels, it also has simulation games for classroom use and Ortega Park Teachers Laboratory was involved as well. Fred Turner, Sam Binkley, Simon Sadler and others have pointed out to what extent shaping um, the whole Earth catalogue and the whole uh, editorial work described um, the, the idea of, of a readership which um, goes back to the, the model of entrepreneurial individualistic being and following the idea of a great whole of technology and nature, which turned its back very much on, on purpose from the suburban world of the organization man of US American post-war society. The ideal of a new um, non-subject uh, which uh, wanted to be self-determined, uh, work on the basis of ecological sense, communi community social practices and uh, progressive non-conformatism became something which uh, was pursued throughout the whole of catalogue by means of teaching and aesthetics of participation, an almost playful type seduction to make people involve themselves down to really become completely immersed in the learning situation. The layout seems chaotic, different fonts, often apparently um, non-related image material and even typos, glitches, all this activated uh, people's uh, look around and they had a cooperative, co-productive attitude towards reading. It was very much something which um, helped the countercultural consumer out of positivity and out of the manipulability of the capitalist every day, going into the deep play of the tools, using the catalogue as a tool to come to a holistic experience of the world. It's a blue tra point for the counter education. Nonlinear resonance, following the, the useful tunes in, in the juxtaposition of the tools, that was all something which sociologist Morris Stein and, uh, and Larry Miller noticed. They were teaching at California Institute of Arts, CalArts, and uh, from 66 and 67, they worked with charts, pedagogical charts, in order to visualize the discursive landscape in the field of tension that existed between culture, culture, id idols like Herbert Marcuse and Marshall McLuhan on the, on the other. Having the title Blueprint for Counter Education in 1970, um, a box appeared, which Marshall Hendry had designed very elaborately, which had an illustrated so-called shooting script and three large-scale uh, posters on the basis of Steins and Miller's dialectic, uh, dialectic um, discourse diagrams. The pedagogical concept of this um, a new of um, in, in the introduction into the world of uh, psychedelic and um, critique of society type of thinking, of thinking, which was part of sur surrealist montage, McLuhan's media theory, which we see articulated in the Mandela type patterns and Rorschach test designs in graphic terms, which really united the two counterculture of the new left and the community way, was very much driven by the idea that taking over um, the transition from modern to postmodern is in a area of participation of aesthetic and, and teaching is, is what it would all learn in this new environment. There would be increased willingness and ability to non-linear, immersive, playful way of being contemporaries and being intellectual survivors. Marshall Henry had poster designs and others had counter-education and blueprint for counter-education posters. They were supposed to have that in their apartments and other improvised learning areas. Um, they should act like wallpaper. And uh, so they would be not just cognitively, but also somatically absorbed, as we can see in one of the films, uh, which, we, uh, which was inspired by the whole of um, contact, the film of names and quotes is what I'm talking about, the shooting script of the project. Again in 1970, um, Esquire magazine, the New York magazine, um, considered the world whole earth catalogue as a trend phenomenon, and the lifestyle experts in the East Coast were absolutely amazed, fascinated by the great diversity, confusing uh, superfluity of content and the mysterious um, capriciousness of format, the incredible variousness of its forms, as it was called. Um, the catalogue looked at a mysterious principle of internal dynamics, some inscrutable law of metaphysics, that's what they suspected to be at the back, which was simply incomprehensible and could hardly be defined by those even at the centre of the whole earth operation. The knowledge architecture of the catalogue seemed to many like a labyrinth, like a, an unfathomable techno-epistemic landscape, which was a time, kind of Latour 
assembly of things was also interesting. It made made the shock of the new, as Simon Sandler described it. It, it really attracted people to get into the world and the system of the whole Earth catalogue. That was an epistemological and existential adventure, an expedition into the realms of a new maturity, while at the same time taking up a subcultural context of the practice of uh, hunter-gatherers, of teachers, of teaching, of building. The idea, in order to use um, cultural studies terms, it was a sort of heroic consumption in the interest of a deeper natural planetary cosmic order. But it was actually one of the crucial factors for the fascination um, that this apparently arbitrary or eclectic at least connection of different types of uh, horticultural tools and introduction into Far Eastern ways of thinking where we see a combination of pastoral romantic ideas and futuristic technological expertise. The whole of Atalant was a feedback, participation, and, and, and uh, platform, which allowed people to have uh, new experiences, holistic experiences, uh, new insights as a subject of soci societal, cultural, and psychological change. The active consumer uh, was defined. Um, who got more um, social and ecological consumption. The consumer is more powerful, good or real than the voter, it says in the last, uh, last whole of catalogue, 71. Seems familiar to us now, doesn't it? The consumer, therefore, is requested to have a post-political ethics and to be willing to self-optimize. Personal growth, renewal of the power of the individual, if that is really successful, then governmental techniques of uh, self-reliance, self-control are demanded, and successfully ap apply, uh, applying those is something which would be necessary for this type of lifestyle. As Sam Benkley says, there's a tension between this project individual, radically autonomous way of self-realization and what is a, a sort of non-traditional economic, entrepreneurial, interesting requirement of um, expertness. And that is what really moderates and accompanies the whole idea. It's the raison d'etre of the experimental, pedagogical, sometimes almost sect-like project, Whole New Earth. The uh, offsprings that Brand didn't authorize but accepted, um, and the New Earth catalog had a lot of gaps, which became clear in that. One of these offsprings was New Women's Survival Catalog, 73, looking at 212 pages of feministic, uh, feminist education initiatives, study programs, self organizing anti rape courses, or even um, giving information about women's bookshops or feminist uh, info shops. The principle of having a medium which allowed women to network with other women to obtain feminist knowledge, to have access to the infrastructure, the self-organization of feminist uh, teacher training, to feminist uh, vocational training and information was part of the original Whole Earth Catalogue. And just the same way, it was part of a comprehensive, counterculturally determined type of educational movement. New Postman, who was critical towards the free school movement, but it was uh, still uh, very open-minded. He was a media and educational scientist in the mid-1980s. He had he sold a bestseller, uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death, became internationally well-known. And in 1971, in The Realist, a magazine, he determined something. The magazine was close to the Old Earth Project, and he wrote an article about the alternative education in the 1970s, together with Charles Weingartner, who developed uh, books like uh, Teaching as a Subversive Activity or The School Book, and all sorts of theses were combined to make a educational reform project. Various ideas with the implied pedagogical program of Whole Earth Catalogue were clear. Namely, Postman demands a deep profitalization of education to take away marks and, and student files, to redefine what basic skills actually mean in, in favor of uh, developing communication skills and having technical media like photography, film, video introduced in the schoolroom, the new definition of what teaching actually means, introducing new subjects and things like ecology, film, ethnic relations, uh, urban development, and that sort of thing. Thing, recognizing the new role of parents, parents as decision makers in the education process, and particularly important, to legitimize emotions, which in experimental schools had already been done in order to uh, open up the, the emotive um, area in which students live as, as a legitimate field of research for both the students themselves and the teachers. At the same time as Postman, futurologist Alvin Toffler, in his bestseller Future Shock, written in 1970, analyzed um, how the existing education system failed 
in uh, accepting the challenges of a basically changing um, cultural economic reality as a result of technology and information processing. Toffler said education had to make sure, above all, that it increased the capability in inverted commas of the individual, uh, his or her ability to cope with the socio-technical changes of, of the current and the future. In other words, the capability route goes through speculation, anticipation of the future, where people need to learn our methods and techniques, which allow them to make repeated, probabilistic, increasingly longer assumption about the future, in order to make their own self as flexible and adjustable as possible, so as to be prepared for the growing change rates of technical of the technical environment. With Gilles Deleuze together, Tuffler was demanding an insight that the um, from the apparent free freedom of the disciplinary society between two imprisonments, uh, we've now moved to the in unlimited uh, stop of control societies. Toffler observed the educated elites, whole of catalog readers were among them, uh, looked at the new types of self-organized teaching and learning aimed at flexibilizing the self as a pedagogically influential evolutionary adjustment. In other words, focusing on kids that were taught by their parents at home or only went to school part of the time, aided by computer technology, flexibilized institutions, allowing children and young people to do internships in schools and companies and in public institutions, uh, which was added to and uh, to uh, education and also deinstitutionalized it. Toffler also pointed out a new time of communication culture, completely new for the young generation. Intensive but also fleeting interhuman relationships were interpreted by him as a, re uh, as a reaction to technologically induced general acceleration of life. Short-term and uh, friendships for Tuffler are indicators for post-family and post-traditional way of life under the pressure of permanent self-change and optimization under a new time regime. Sex, for example, he says, had established um, itself as a method for a quick getting to know another person, a shortcut to deeper human understanding, as he called it. The same wish to accelerate friendship it explains the fascination for psychological techniques such as sensitivity training, encounter groups, micro-laboratories, touchy-feely, non-verbal games, and the whole phenomenon of group dynamics. The enthusiasm for life in communes, as, uh, so Toffler says, actually expressed a profound feeling of loneliness and inability to open up. All these activities uh, basically drives the participants into intimate psychological context without being prepared for that, without having any acquaintance in beforehand. And while these relations tend to be of short nature, the, the purpose of the game is, is the intensification of effective relationships, despite or perhaps because of the temporality of the situation. Before I get to the end, I would like to focus on one specific project. The legitimacy of feelings is something which was a top priority for the whole Earth project as well. Uh, information events such as Life Raft in 1969 was a multi-day social experiment with happening and, and game character. This was all about not just rationally understanding subjects such as global starvation or education policy, uh, population policy, but also to overcome the sort of rational insight through far-reaching and more holistic forms of insight. Perhaps in this collective post-traumatic uh, teaching experience, which normally happened to be in a medialized space, the educative mission of the whole Earth networks became most clearly manifest. Life Raft followed one of the many ideas of Stuart Brand. This time, very much a, a catalyst was Paul Ehrlich's The Population Bomb. This was an apocalyptic, uh, apocalyptic bestseller which really shook people awake, dealt with population growth, written by a biologist and population researcher, one of the professors where Brandon studied, and that really made the idea of a starving hunger game make happy, make um, take shape. More than 100 people from the whole Earth environment met at the parking lot of a motel in North California, Haywood, where within a stylized uh, life raft, which was a sort of blow-up polyethylene architecture made available by an architect and artisan group called Ant Farm, media activists, environmental activists. And they spent a few days here, just out in the open, with open microphones, with a sound system, with chemical loos, film projectors, and lots of local uh, people being interested in watching them, and some media people as well. This was a tribalist activity the film was documented by photographer filmmaker Robert Frank, who branded uh, invited to join the um, hunger and to let the cameras running. And Frank was totally uh, without any strength and joined uh, and dropped out. But later he he joined them again. 
when the people had, had moved uh, into a um, home somewhere in the in, in the mountains, a sort of hut. Um, author Richard Brontigan wrote a, a comprehensive report about life raft. He said, "Many, want, many uh, of our, how many of us arrogant uh, people wanted to improve the world, the world shapers? Did we know hunger? Could we learn it? Could we teach it at the same time?" The idea of game change was particularly important for, for a brighter gun. The game was changed by moving it, by leaving it, by going somewhere else, by starting another one. For many of the audience, but also for many participants, the relationship between pl- the play of hunger and the transitory commune to get to know with each other, while at the same time having a message, was very difficult. So the political and the spiritual actually were not mutually contradictory. On the contrary, they were mutually inter-illuminating. The life raft experience had been a sliding wave length between the Tao conceptual extremes. What had been absolutely crucial was that the game change happened on the on the area in the area of the physical. And here Brontigan shows what the pedagogical legitimacy of feelings, or to be more precise, effects, uh, might have been mentioned in the time space um, university of game and learning without a space. Border. Mind points don't count unless something happens physically. Pain penalties are of no consequence unless something adapts physically. Move the molecules or admit you're a spectator. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Katya, you have the floor now. What I'm going to tell you today is dedicated to the question of how unproductive activity is negotiated in post-Marxian theory, especially in post-structuralism, and um, by French Heidegger followers. You do something, but you don't get anything in return. You have no calculation. In the language of common sense, it's uh, idleness, passivity, doing nothing, failure. This is tolerated and even uh, regarded highly, and uh, Berlin is a laboratory in that sense if this is a privileged deter to an active success. Just a t- temporary suspension of the utility principle and the purpose and means relation, a creative subcultural dissident pause where idleness is the resource for common activity. If unproductiveness in is not returning to the area that is called by McPherson as uh, possessive individualism, where the individual uh, is, owns itself and exercises his or her resources to receive more in return, both in terms of new properties, new in the double meaning of the world, then inactivity in biopolitical capitalist societies are defined exclusively as a failure or a punishment. But what would it mean to be unproductive? How would existence look like if you're not economical, if you do things not for a tr- transcendent purpose where you do not retroactively produce uh, and totalize sense? How would it? So how would you define nothing in the word doing nothing? In order to find an answer to that, you have to look at Georges Bataille, who in the 30s, where there was productivism and the liquidation of all council structures in the Soviet Union, and where he was a member of an anti-Stalinist Cercle Communiste Démocratique, he de- developed the term of loss, uh, that is to say, he called it as, he called it negativity, negati- negative idleness. You act, you exercise your resources, and you don't get anything in return. Nothing returns to you. For Bataille, it was uh, an attempt at uh, juxtaposing uh, Hegel's uh, category of the negative with an existential negative activity which cannot longer be described in a phenomenon, a process or a system because it has not reinvested the risk of death into work. It cannot uh, return to positivity anymore and crosses out uh, the synthetic function of Hegel's uh, Aufhebung and uh, he, he 
negates uh, the term Aufhebung and he develops a difference between an economy that crosses the different in order to relate to itself in the distance between the different things. And it co contrasts that with an economy that succumbs to the different, the other, and uh, merges with it. In such a general economy, as uh, Bataille describes it, negativity is not active. It does not want to reverse the meaning of the terms the time and the real. Bataille links the question of the political with one speculative question. and. This, I think, is a problem because he does that uh, only with a very short-sighted vision. So he links the question of the political with the speculative question of how can uh, Hegel's Aufhebung be made uh, in, invalid. And he creates a kind of uh, negative Aufhebung that we find in Gumbin as well. Nick uh, Hegel says that uh, if you negate something, you find something. And in order to do that, you have uh, always to progress from one definition to the other. And this transition was always a transition of uh, the negative creates a meaning. Negativity and uh, aufhebung are in the circle of absolute knowledge for Hegel. They never just pertain to the realm of totalitarian uh, meaning. But I wants to show that the world of meaning and the world of inactivity are closely linked. He uses uh, Hegel's term par excellence, but shifts it. And he wants to force Hegel's system to represent the milieu that it comes from uh, and to show the meaninglessness, the loss, the inactivity, something that cannot be uh, represented for Bataille because it would immediately disappear in what is happening now because the duration of uh, the present is a space where Hegel has always won back uh, the different. In philosophy, Bataille wants to force a movement which deactivates uh, the big philosophical principles of meaning, the subject, and purpose. And he points just to an existence that goes beyond the realm of philosophy in for Blanchot, uh, Nancy, Angamb, and Esposito have exposed the undefined, the non-existent, as the essence of existence in order to close the gap in Marxism of the political by developing a new existential term of activity and definition of activity. And that is why they have never tried to unlink Bataille's idea for, uh, of uh, inactive negativity from the uh, heterodox Heg Hegelianism. Deleuze, Agamb, and following Bataille have, uh, in a totally different way, exposed the question of non-economic practice and have uh, contrasted that with Marx's terms of practice. And here, I'd like to present a few rough theses about the relationship of left-wing subculture, existential and politics, and capitalist critique. The thesis, uh, the beginning is the thesis uh, that one of the most important terms of subculture is the non-economic existence, which is more than simply doing nothing, but is a subtractive uh, and articulates a subtractive praxis. What's at stake is uh, the uh, logic of utilization, exploitation, and division of labor that has always coexisted with flexible and very hard dividing lines along racist, heteronominative, and homonormative lines. Minority politics is a fragile, creates a fragile distance to the world of uh, 
added value, morals, and verdict, but still the promise of happiness and the experience that you can be equal in differences and conflict, that all qualities uh, become random and can further diversify because they remain unmeasured, unclassified. Without doing anything, you could be part of the group. You can waste your life uh, without becoming guilty a relationship of power that uh, aggravates the co political conflict between capitalist and biopolitical um, societies. In spite of the fact that uh, ever since the 19th uh, century, minority politic f policy forms have been integrated into the capitalist societies, which uh, are can be translated into forces of complex modernizations, and one should avoid three premature conclusions. And this is done partially in this exhibition. We should not compare minority policy and the uneconomic economic ex existence and failure. Not, we should not subsume everything under the uh, term of capitalist modernization. So when it's all about uh, correcting idealizations that were inherent in the dialectic ideas of Marx, that history can overcome its bad side, the pain of the negative, the intensification of exploitation and utilization. This identification of minority policies with uh, its failure is a failure. Benjamin, in his Baudelaire essay, says that this fallacy is already evident in uh, Marx and Engels' critique of the Boheme and the uh, July, July monarchy with the society of the seasons and the alliance of uh, the fair. Marx here juxtaposes them with uh, the practice of the industrial proletariat. In the 18th Brumaire, Marx summarizes this emergence of proletarian practices by saying that these practices are always criticizing themselves, always interrupt themselves in their own progression, always come back to what they have seemingly achieved before in order to start from the beginning again until Finally, circumstances say hic rodas, hic salta. Against uh, the backdrop of polit difficult political uh, positions, historical forces, undogmatic and uh, radical pol policies were repeated over and over again so that sometimes the revolts of the years 1966 to 68 were reduced to a capitalist modernization attempt and uh, development of a differential capitalism. Such an evolutionist tendency is also shown, shown uh, in Boltanski and Ciappello's criticism of uh, the uh, thesis of Adam Curtis and his film, uh, The Century and the Selves. And uh, the same goes for Barbock and Cameron's article of the Californian ideology, which was published in the 90s, which uh, in analogy with one of the hypotheses of this uh, exhibition sees a diagnosis, a synthesis of hippies, uh, Reaganomics, and cyberne uh, cybernetic governments. I would say that investigation of a reintegration of existential revolts in capitalist uh, subjectivation and consumpt con consumption must be analyzed in order to understand uh, the counter trends of the anti-imperialist and anti-colonial uh, left-wing forces of the 60s that have uh, vanished. We should not forget that the uh, Californian yippies, the youth international parties, which tried to make the hippies more political, show that the un anarchist grassroots practice of the hippies was in spite, uh, has, has ended into an alliance with the Black Panthers Party. The oh, I'm sorry, I can't even write my uh, script. The fall of the hippies shows that during that time, in the 60s, 
questions of reintegration were very controversial. The problem of return to the white uh, middle class, the alternative business that came into being with Woodstock, the uh, holistic uh, philosophy, the escapism, the communal movement, patriarchal uh, codes in the movement, and identity policy orientations were very important topics of the time. And they were quite controversial, just as the controversy that existed between Eldridge Cleaver, James Baldwin, or Jean Genet, when they talked about uh, anti-imperialist movements. My third thesis today, and this brings me to the end of my statement, has something to do, to do with the theoretical discourse on non-economic activity and existential act in post-Marxism, where two difficult problems, as I see it, arise. First of all, the subsumation of political practices uh, to individual philosophical principles, uh, loyalty, uh, part participation, uh, failure, and excess, and the short-term identification of existential political acts. I'd like to remind you of the fact that in post-structuralism, post-operaism, and uh, Heidegger, Heideggerianism use inactivity and activity in a discourse uh, where the idea of non-economic practice was contrasted with the uh, oh, Marxist term. The dialectic link between uh, economic theory and revolutionary theory was typical for Marx, but either capitalism in its progressing development of its contradictions uh, aggravated the conditions for its very existence and its crisis, or on the other hand, the uh, working class would not allow itself to be reduced to uh, just uh, labor resource. And so we have two different perspectives of a revolution which end up in a negation of a negation and an expropriation of the expropriators. But High's idea of uh, unemployed negativities and non-synthetic uh, dialectic uh, where negation does not create something but uh, dispossesses something is used by Agamb in the 1980s when he writes a number of essays about the thesis of the autonomy of uh, incapability. The inspiration to this thesis that the modality category of what's possible is not characterized by its transition into reality, but rather by avoiding to do something, Agamb in Heidegger's uh, lectures finds a number of uh, new categories, uh, and here he focuses on a new unorthodox uh, um, uh, Aristotelian uh, category of what's possible and what's real, and here he reverses it to the primate of uh, the possible. Aristotle deals with the megarix uh, who negate the existence and have Aristotle explains that an architect still can build when he does not build, and a guitar player can still play when she does not play. So the possible is always implied, even though it may not take place. Otherwise, it would always have become reality, and that's the uh, our political secret of uh, Aristotle's teachings for Agamb. Uh, the possible is the possibility to do nothing. The exercise of doing nothing is always an option uh, for existence. So a society is not characterized by an exchange of activities, but by also accepting the fact that nothing is being done. Aristotle, when asking what will happen to inability when you act, if the guitar pl uh, player plays, if she performs the act, Agam's idea is that this is a negation of, that is not synthesizing but deactivating. Aristotle has written in the anima that the uh, inability is preserved in the 
exercise of the act. So it is preserved. So the ability to do something does not disappear when you do it. It is always, uh, it remains intact. And for Agamp, this is the starting point of uh, a messian, uh, messiah dialectic of um, doing nothing. So you can, the existential act for Agamp is that the negated inability, uh, the potency of doing nothing is released into uh, reality and it negates all activity. Agam focuses on the productivity and the activity norms of capitalists and biopolitical relationships, but his analysis is always being based on one existential principle the potency to do nothing, the inability and the thinking of uh, politics would lose all kinds of strategic complete interaction. There is just one existential principle with beyond all quality and is important for existence the perseverance in what is possible. This kind of thinking can no longer develop a theory about the inner dynamisms of practices. Deleuze shares with Agam his interest in the deactivating and subtractive effects of existence. Bartleby uh, theorizes something that is called uh, unemployed positivity by uh, Agam. The pragmatism of activity that does not create something but rather deteriorates and de decomposes something. Bartleby says, I prefer not to. This is a linguistic form of the differential between activity and passivity, a preference which is related to nothing and a refusal that is uh, seen as something that uh, he prefers for Deleuze. Uh, this is something that he describes in the office work of a lawyer. Deleuze, in contrast to Agamp, uh, follows the theory that a potency that is not exhausted in the act and the mystic of the negative theology, an idea of uh, what is not appropriable uh, is contrasted. Let me just uh, think about two aspects of Deleuze's uh, non-economic existence. Um, he relates to Spinoza's metaphysics, why differentiation is not thought holistically, but uh, is subordinated to the primate of singularization. In Deleuze, uh, there is no political existential acts. Uh, being for Deleuze is not inability or doing something or not doing something. It's an articulation of uh, differentiality. The being articulates internal differences between terms like an undefined preference and a clear refusal. But no act, but even not Bartleby's, I prefer not to, is a model or for existence. Deleuze is interested in the internal dynamisms of practices that articulate themselves between minimal and maximum um, thresholds of abilities. One will have to try out in practice where practices uh, do have a non-normative effect and where they begin to be reactionary or authoritarian, where they can be destroyed or destroy themselves. This makes it possible to see the historic transition between emancipation and failure. We are so dramatically exposed to it. Uh, on the basis of that, we can understand it. And we can also understand politics as a militant exercise and an interaction of uh, plural practices, which due to its heterogeneity uh, can always be interrupted. So it does not become reactionary. The ability of political existence uh, does not only include unproductive exercise, but also the planning and anticipating organization. But in none of these abilities, there is a historical meaning and a coming and becoming one uh, whole. And this makes uh, all the difference. Thank you. Um, thank you, Katja. And we will now hear from Mercedes Bunz. It's rather strange.
strange now because um, you just heard from Katya. I'm going in exactly the wrong, the, the opposite direction. You spoke about negation. I'm going to speak a lot about affirmation. So it's going to be a bit difficult between us. But as part of my presentation, I mean, you see, I always thought about where is the link between those, and I think the reason why we're talking about all this is basically the same. We're talking about the disappearance of the outside, a problem which is very much a problem for counterculture and critical thinking. And then we also think about the the idea of emancipation and failure, which you put so nicely, which I find is very important. I want to start this um, uh, presentation with a picture I secretly took from the exhibition. It says, Nymist, uh, nature isn't rivers and uh, rivulets, but uh, worms and spiders, my favorite exhibit. Uh, after that, we're going to talk very much about neoliberalism. I've worked about neoliberalism before with Home Freebo together many years ago. We had this absolutely crazy idea of asking whether there is or has to be a left wing liberalism, neoliberalism, something which really followed me even when I wrote about Facebook and uh, wrote a text called uh, Critiquing the Error of Affirmation. And um, well, some of my presentation is about this. And uh, my presentation has three parts. It won't be that long. And first of all, it's all about uh, what has shifted. And second, what sort of arguments therefore go into a total void. And third, well, what comes now? Um, by the way, I call it um, escape line, structural adjustments. That's this panel uh, in which I found myself. And the, the question was, well, can there be such a thing as structural adjustment? What happened? And is that enough adjustment? And for many years now, we, as Katya and Tom also noted, we've been quite um, amazed at these sort of distortions, shifts, the failure of emancipation, for example. And when I reflected this, I noticed that one of the first instances showed me that this, the signs we once uh, thought were our own started changing signs. Something what Diedrich said, the kids are not all right. Uh, you wrote uh, in 1992, farewell to youth culture. And um, there's another instance where we noted a similar shift, a shift from emancipation to, well, failure, really. That was when, um, when we moved the oratic gestures out of art, and creativity suddenly became a left problem. And the specter of the new spirit of capitalism had really started with that. And self-determination is no longer something which we freely choose, but became a precondition for everyone. And the most terrifying thing is culture provided the soundtrack for all these movements. So what do we do with it? How do we cope with this dilemma? So we, shall we sort of just leave the thinking term ship? Shall we just take notes of what's happening? And my presentation is an attempt to look for new ways, new gestures, basically a, a way of navigating because one thing is quite clear, the logic which we use to guide our life is no longer modern. The beams of the discourse have shifted, have changed, have warped. Terms we grew fond of were once glowing things are now like sort of grey rags, not allowing us to see what we should see. Reference points which gave us a blinding view of the world now are like uh, sort of cupboards which have been upset and they're in our way. They don't allow us to, to march on their obstacles. Something secretly, mysteriously, quietly has become totally wrong. There is a list of examples I would give you, and obviously I'm not giving you all the examples there are, but still there are examples which show that the shift which I'm talking about is a profound one. Up into the 1990s, the critique of counterculture uh, trended to be against politics rather than against the economy. The nation was the most important enemy, much more than the enterprise. I mean, in, in the panel uh, announcement, they say, you know, it was a, against businesses. But I think up into the 1980s, business was seen as a sort of adjunct to politics, i.e. capitalist politics. Uh, today now, the development um, has been rather different. Um, Common Karl Polanyi in 1944 wrote this book, The Great Transformation, and he already foreshadowed this, saying politics today has become not nothing but an appendix to business. 
Or in other words, there is no such thing as a future anymore. Utopia doesn't exist. The future of humankind is simply the climate catastrophe. And something else which one wouldn't have assumed or ever expected, technology, once the, the spaceship of utopia exploded and became, as Alex Slade calls it, and yesterday he said it too, a new nature. It became very clear when he looked at the slides that you can't keep the two apart anymore. As soon as you open your eyes in the morning, this technology creeps into your very bed, um, you know, by having a mobile phone which doubles as an alarm clock and becomes an email client immediately and you check your work emails. Another point, um, disturbance is no longer a critique of conditions, but it's the current mode of homo economicus. Automization has leaped ahead and has made knowledge, language, writing, move, contemplation and concentration. These two very, very difficult things become nothing but attention these days. And a shameless discourse on instrumentalization is sort of making an acid trace across our wonderful life and, and suffocating it. We have a sort of um, all-round renewal. Everything has to make sense. Everything has to be an article of use, including um, the humanities. This is a sort of uh, useful logic. It's not about value added, but about valid ad, uh, valued ad, value for use. And you say, how can it be useful for society? Society is something good. Useful is good. So in German, it's rather difficult to put that. And even when I talk to colleagues, what do we define as usefulness? When we're talking about this logic of, of um, utilization, we're really not talking about the, the added value, but about the use value. That's the other issue, which is really important to bear in mind. And of course, something which is very important, the discursive figure that everybody is working with, and which is sort of um, secretly slipped in, and really nasty, something you have to really fight against, but you don't even notice. It's this, this typical argument where people say, quote, unquote, there is no alternative. And that brings me to the thesis of my presentation. The era of affirmation has dawned, and I want to give you an example of that. And that example, um, that's two videos. Uh, one is a speech given by Margaret Thatcher about the European Union, and 21 years later, it's another speech given by David Cameron about the European Union. They both say exactly the same thing. They're both Tories, which obviously means they reject the European Union. But what I found was absolutely fascinating was the fact that Margaret Thatcher's speech became absolutely well known because she said, no, no, no. Well, Cameron, David Cameron, one day after he mm, made uh, EU negotiations fail, explains to the parliament, well, actually what it said was yes. I thought that was fascinating because he saw the change in the discourse. Let, let's listen to the two. Increase its powers. Yes, it is a non-elected body, and I do not want the Commission to increase its powers against this House. So, of course, we are differing. Of course, the Chairman or the President of the Commission, Mr. Delors, said at press conference the other day that he wanted the European Parliament to be the democratic body of the community, he wanted the Commission to be the executive, and he wanted the Council of Ministers to be the Senate. No, no, no. So that was Margaret Thatcher. Now we hear David Cameron. A deal at 27, and I responded to the German and French proposal for treaty change in good faith, genuinely looking to reach an agreement at the level of the whole of the European Union with the, with the necessary safeguards for Britain. Those safeguards on the single market and on financial services were modest, reasonable and relevant. We were not trying to create an unfair advantage for Britain. We were not asking for a UK opt-out, for special exemption, or a generalised emergency break on financial services legislation. They were safeguards sought for the EU as a whole. We were simply asking for a level playing field for... Also, das reicht, glaube ich, um mal zu sagen, also er sagt, wir haben ja irgendwie gar nicht... I think that's enough. It uh, tells us so. We were in favour, we didn't ask for this and that and the other. We were really very good, boys. It's quite extraordinary because it shows you that he hides in a sort of little affirmation clause. He said by sort of waving the affirmation flag, basically you show that you were a good guy, you were in favor. And that brings me to the second point. And now I can't even read what I've written myself here. Um, yes, the, the uh, 
I think it's just like the, the argumentation we've become accustomed to has failed. But I think we can go a step further. We can even say, as I say somewhere else, in greater detail, negation, the way it used to be used, has uh, lost its power and becomes neutralized. I'll give you one example here, the Murdoch uh, phone tapping scandal. Um, of 2011. Obviously, that brought a hailstorm of social critique. That was the last edition of the News of the World. Um, the News of the World was the, the paper which was uh, part of the, was the scandal, at least initially. The question was, how did Murdoch react to this? First of all, he accepted the criticism. He didn't say, why well, we didn't do this, something like that. What he said instead was, well, this is the most humble day of my life. Um, what followed then was quite interesting. The arguments. I mean, I you know really analyze what uh, was said then um, in front of the then government. He sort of denied the power he had and tried to sort of evade that. The original quote was, "I hold responsible the people who I trusted to run it and the people they trusted." So the argument basically, I'm so high up, my company is so large. How could I possibly be responsible for what other people have done? Yeah, you know, I have no idea what they were doing. What happened then is. Um, the news of the world being closed down. First of all, that seems impressive because it's a um, 2.6 million copy uh, newspaper every week. Also meant 200 journalists uh, were fired. Most of them had nothing to do with the phone tapping scandal at all. And then the management, uh, they attempted to protect it. I thought that was fascinating because you'd need to bear in mind if you study the Murdoch uh, conglomerate, news of the world was a bit of a sinking ship anyway. The same week, the Sun and Sunday, um, the other big yellow press issues, you know, News of the World was a Sunday paper only. And at the same time, he, he made sure he got, uh, uh, you know, really big plan for reintroducing his son on Sunday. Uh, so this is the most humble day of the life. Hmm. One year later, when the victims of the phone tapping scandal met Prime Minister Cameron, on Twitter, Murdoch called them scumbag celebrities pushing for even more privacy laws. So that shows very clearly that negation here runs into a void. When criticized, Murdoch basically says, we're not responsible, we think it's bad, we're on your side, which obviously uh, is only sort of, you know, making apparent little concessions which don't exist. And so dialectics basically has given up its swing of the pendulum in favor of a simultaneous movement. But we've seen that coming for some time. Deleuze and Guattari, for example, um, called the deterritorialization as a change of uh, roots. There's a sort of movement which I'm just indicating, and then there's a counter movement uh, which um, uh, doesn't allow the first movement to continue along the line it would have taken otherwise. So if you refer to that, then we could say that today, de- and re-territorialization are happening at the same time, a bit like what I was indicating now. I think this is quite interesting, and that's why the the uh, pivotal figure, the shifting figure idea, which threaded its way through the conference, is so important. It's a sort of almost current theory type metaphor, something which we find again when we go through the exhibition, look at the, look at the exhibits. I'd even say that today. I've got to find my way in the text again, sorry. Um, we can't say that deterritorialization and re-territorialization are, are, you know, they are happening at the same time. So that is why we no longer talk about a negative or a positive. In other words, about a re-territorialization, which is successful, it's uh, penetrating, but everything's happening at the same time. So the differential conditions have shifted. And this brings me to point three, namely, what now? If the dialectics have become exacerbated and we are experiencing re and re territorialization, de territorialization simultaneously, doesn't mean there's no dialectics anymore. And something which helps us think about this is the idea of diffraction. Diffraction, as um, proposed by Karen Barrett following Donna Haraway, which helps us think things. And instead of a binarity of clearly separate opposites, it shows um, a sort of overlaying idea where, well, the diffraction, where things are, yes, different from one from the other, but we can't think of them as completely separate from each other. So it's not black or white, it's both uh, coming together. But this does not mean that they give up the differences uh, that exist there. On the contrary, 
even in a dark corner, there could be bright spots. But only if the bright spots have taken over the dark corner will their condition have changed. What this means is that, principally, a dialectic remains. So you can still speak of a difference, but the manifestation in the world is far more complex than simply a for or against. All these shifts, and uh, I think it's very important to think about this, because uh, if people say, well, in the past, Stuart Brand, for example, the whole Earth catalog, there was a culture, a counterculture project which lost the counter element. I think that's not quite enough. I mean, you have to look at what really happened. Uh, I mean, I'm sure it's not to respond for neoliberalism, the neoliberalism we live with today. But still, we have to ask about the context between what was happening with the whole Earth catalog and neoliberalism. Anyway, all these, these shifts and changes have led, led to a sort of restiveness, and certainly in my environment, to a lot of activities which um, aim at uh, thinking criticism in a different way. So we may say we may live in an era of affirmation, but there is no alternative? Of course there is. It means that this moment of counter in criticism should be seen as something different. And thereby, we need to talk about uh, repetition, affirmation, and diffraction. So something which is only just starting here on the website, there's not much on it yet, but Katrin Thiele and Birgit Kaiser, two of my colleagues, um, initiated an interdisciplinary network for the critical humanities, which they call Terra Critica. What it focuses on is, is criticism from a point of view of imminence. Karen Barra, Donna Haraway are obviously very much uh, involved here. And instead of the traditional uh, looking for distance, looking for a counter, anything, they're trying to put the stay with the troubled on Haraway or taking care approach, asking ourselves, what does this mean theoretically? I was thinking of something Juliana Rabentish said the other day, which really stuck in my mind, saying that problems don't lead you out of the world and problems aren't supposed not to exist. Problems actually lead you into the world. At Lufana University, where I work, there's a project where we're trying to use the problems of technical digitization in a different way. And instead of rejecting the term digital humanities, we've decided to use the term, but don't leave it alone and to um, change it in an affirmative way. And inspired by Raymond Williams' keywords, therefore, at um, our, our Center for Digital Culture, the project CDC Keywords for Digital Humanities is uh, emerging. We're using terms uh, under rearrange, rescues, uh, reuse, analyze, and, and sort of dust and shift the meaning of, of places, giving them a new situative context where new expected terms are used, tactical media, post media, digital natives, and so on, in, in affirmative, critical way. But we also try to look at things like precariousness or digital labor. These are also part of the digital humanities. Something you haven't yet started with as a project, but probably will because it's sort of floating around. Um, and that's, um, we should, despite all this self determination that we are ordered to feel, we should go back to the idea of alienation and use that term in a productive way. Because we all know we have this fulfilled life, yes, but it can't be because we all know revolution hasn't happened. So we aren't really living in a liberated environment. And that's why some new interested uh, groups are meeting around this alienation term. One of them is Eva Goylen, who wrote, a, who gave a presentation called "The Problems and Positions of Subject Subject Theories," um, and she uses segambas, which um, exist in today's capitalist society, as way of an agglomeration of technical dispositions, which prevent a subject from emerging. And uh, looking at the internet, looking at mobile phones as an example, and I agree with Goylen and think that we often blame technology for capitalism. And this sort of um, hatred of technology may be very fashionable, but I think it's not very clever. It, it means people show they're critical, but society stays the same, and uh, you don't really op oppose the mainstream. So I'd like to agree with Walter Benjamin, who said that technology is actually the point where the new tendencies come together. And so don't kill the messenger or mistake the messenger in the message. The problem isn't the medium being the message. At the same time, of course, I think that technology plays a vital role, an ontological, uh, ontological role for society. Technology has really changed the way we stand in this world. But it doesn't mean that we cannot shape technology. In order to um, get this structural adjustment issue um, 
really to the point here. Adjustment alone isn't enough. Today we have to combat alienation at the same time. And um, that helps us to live in a society which demands self-determination all the time. One question for theory, therefore, is in this uh, de re territorializing world, how can we not just turn dialectics upside down, but turn it aside in order to think the difference? Because there is a difference, even though it's sometimes not very easy to find the Archimedes point for the difference. Difference has to be insisted on. Thank you. And now, we have had such a diversity of different things and have to somehow try and summarize it. At the beginning, we have had a discourse about educational projects and their transforming attempts. Such educational projects constitute something like a concrete expression of what alternative failure could move or emancipation, where it becomes evident what failure is, what emancipation is, what a step towards failure or emancipation could be. And so it might have been quite a meaningful discourse consisting of three parts. That still doesn't bring me to a question, but uh, if you've got a question, well, I'll give you a chance immediately. I mean, Tom has talked about the debinarization and He's tried to describe the relationship between uh, negation and negativity, negativity, the economy and the affirmative. And here you have made a remark regarding the necessity of uh, debinarization. I mean, why can't we put things up? side down. If we don't do that, then they could uh, fall to the sides. And in a historical landscape, always alternatives would emerge, would form, would be formed. And one reference point for our exhibition is also the uh, image of the blue planet. It's not just a message of a debinarization into some kind of affirmative globalistic oceanic network paradigm. It's also an ideological appeal. So what I want to ask you is, what would be your response if somebody said that negativity, well, if there were relations between spaces and negativity. I mean, you have just described Agamba's attitude. It was a pathological description of depression. Uh, if every gesture has some messianic call. How could we combine that? I mean, if we think about the environment, the milieu, it uh, always has a double meaning. The uh, ecological and meaning and the meaning of surrounding all of us. How about the link between the ideology and ecology? How could we think that it's one of the major resources the whole Earth project is based on? That's a huge issue, but basically, Eric Hurl should answer that because he is doing work on eco on the ecology. Maybe you can do that later on. Ideological uh, aspects. Uh, that's uh, very good. 
as a reference and I haven't understood one thing. Uh, it became clear to me when I looked at uh, the slideshow. I always thought that instead of a political political utopia uh, or, or or future, we would just have a climate uh, catastrophe. There would be no more society. There would just be negations that keep us together in common fear. And. This is something now you can see slowly. And now you could really ask yourself, have we ever seen a picture of the whole Earth? Um, Katja's considerations about uh, being idle, doing nothing, and the fact that it is uh, also a political resource in that you can avoid dialectic figures. For me, I've thought a lot about hyperactivity regarding education, self-education, the use of your own potentials, the development of your own potential. There, um, indeed, I could see that this is very far away from Barnaby's position, even when all kinds and all forms of functioning in a democratic society is being refused. And now that we see a kind of uh, refusal type of anthropology that develop its own form of, uh, develops its own form of productivity, and negates the fact that every action will constitute a counteraction. And uh, but this is not something that will stay forever. We have a permanent process of optimization, not in within the meaning of uh, capitalist vision. But we do have optimization anyway, and we strive for optimization because we never abandon the idea that something can be generated, something can be developed. And here I think on the level of the implicit anthropology, uh, we see an abyss forming. Just let me respond briefly. I'd like to say something about overdetermination. When we think a milieu, an environment, look at a gamb. I gave this example in order to show how such proposals are a response to certain uh, barriers in Marxism. But it's very difficult uh, as far as a gamb is concerned. It's very difficult to constitute uh, the uh, the political, and uh, of course we are surrounded by hysteria, especially in Berlin. I mean, even in the 90s, it wasn't uh, as bad. Uh, we always have this kind of invocation of uh, invocation of entrepreneurial spirits, and I mean, there's so many political dystopias. And what's happening now is a kind of uh, modulation of an invocation of self-entrepreneurialism. And the things that you have described in your work, namely, how are you called upon, how you always push to always learn. I mean, we have this uh, entrepreneurial hype, and it's exposed so often, uh, if you 
don't have a job, uh, you have to attend a course which is organized by the Job Center, and it always uh, uses terms like entrepreneurial spirit and it sort of uh, is degrading. And we are moving in a society which is uh, rearticulating itself, and they are very hard exclusion lines, a lot of discipline. And I think uh, to get away from discipline to um, welfare society and uh, material to an immaterial society, we don't even have the right ideas for that. Not, we just are focusing on evolutionary uh, short-term buzzwords, a kind of safety uh, logic, autonomy, which is based on self-control. And here, we should strengthen historically accumulated mechanisms, extreme or authoritarian ones that we have uh, inherited. And this can be described with the term overdetermination. The question that I had when I saw the film Life Raft once again, and when I listened to your presentation, Katja, I mean, what you see there, I mean, is put in a context. Is that, is that what you later call minoritarian policy? And what in that context would be the, con the uh, opposite of failure? You said one shouldn't identify minoritarian mo movements with their failure. I mean, what we actually do is we are angry with the minoritarian movements because they were successful. But it was not a success that eventually led to a larger degree of emancipation. That's the medium of radical minoritarian policy. What radical minoritarian movements always resort to the rather molecular level. And it developed as an alternative to earlier traditional forms of resistance organized uh, politics. And these successes The, the question is, when you look at those dancing people on a roof that are participating in an educational sensitization project, how do we define success and failure there in this precise example? I have to defend counterculture now against uh, uh, Dietrich. I don't think one can say that counterculture is the prop it has won because now everyone uh, and they're now punished with the bad term self-determination. Here we should really differentiate. Think about re- and deterritorialization. Self-determination was a term that was quite meaningful, meaningful in the old days. Today it has a different meaning. It's a no longer as positive as it used to be. So I wouldn't speak of a failure. Together with Katya, I would say one has to make sure that we don't support the bad guys in power with our ideology. I mean, the people dancing on the roof, I mean, that looks uh, ridiculous as always when something is over, but not long ago. 20 years later, uh, it's all different. When you see um, people in clothes of the 80s today, would, you would say, well, they are cool. In the 90s, you were embarrassed to see it. 
the idea that we can build up a new society from the one we have just by people getting together, behave differently. This power of is totally disappeared. And that is why I wouldn't say countercultures have failed. They do have a number of problems at the moment, but uh, we are here to discuss them.